So, um, hi everyone. I, I'm Susie Wampler, Regional Coordinator, Coordinator for Jasmine Southwest here in Los Angeles. Welcome to today's special event um, featuring Professor Melinda Finberg of the USC School of Dramatic Arts, who uh, will be speaking on the topic, The Theatrical Jane Austen. Um, if you haven't already, let us know. Let us know where you're tuning in from in the, in the chat box. And um, I'd like to just begin by thanking all of our donors who contributed to make this event possible. We had 34 people who, who generously donated and special thanks go to Claire and Bob Vellante who have been our underwriting sponsors for this whole series over the past year um, and a half for during COVID. Uh, we do intend to continue next year, even after we go back to some in-person meetings, having at least two, two Zoom meetings a year, maybe more, um, so that we can continue what's been one of the great, you know, positive things that have come out of the COVID-19 pandemic, and that's being able to connect with people, j Knights around the world for these wonderful um, gatherings. It's been really fun, and we do plan to continue that. But our next Zoom meeting will be June 19th. And we'll be joined by Emmy Award-winning costumer Ellen Mirajnik, whose talent helped Bridgerton become such a global phenomenon. She oversaw the design of 7,500 costumes or pieces and uh, 5,000 costumes for Bridgerton. So that will be a fun conversation, which will be moderated by Deborah Nadulman Landis, who herself is an Oscar-nominated uh, costume designer and founding director of the David C. Copley Center for Costume Design at UCLA. Registration will open soon. And again, that's um, set for June 19th. A couple of Zoom housekeeping matters. Again, um, if you um, will enter any questions in the chat box, that would be great, but start with the word questions. So it'll be easier for me to spot that. During the talk, if you um, have any technical difficulties, enter that in the chat and don't interrupt the presentation. You're probably the only one having the issue and we'll try to help you in the chat function but it really, we really appreciate you not interrupting. Uh, again, don't unmute yourself. You, you know, will hear any little distractions, lawn mowing, what have you in the background. So um, please stay muted during the, the talk and enter any questions in the chat box. So again, to better view the presentation, if you go into the upper right corner, you'll see view and you can choose speaker function or speaker view to see Melinda a little more clearly. And um, if you have connection issues, you might want to turn off your video. That sometimes helps. So now it is my pleasure to introduce Melinda Finberg. Melinda is an associate professor at the USC School of Dramatic Arts. She is nationally known dramaturg and um, scholar of theater history. Her volume, 18th Century Women Dramatists from Oxford University Press, is now in its third printing and is taught in colleges and universities across the US, Europe, and Canada. This anthology opened college classrooms to historical women playwrights by giving teachers and students access to authoritative, annotated editions of plays that had previously been available only in rare books libraries. She has been instrumental in bringing these plays to professional and university stages. She received the 2006 Elliott Hayes Award for Achievement in Dramaturgy from the Literary Managers and Dramaturgs of the Americas for her work on the 2005 Oregon uh, Oregon Shakespeare Festival's critically acclaimed revival of Hannah Cooley's The Bell Stratagem. And you'll hear a little bit more about that later today. She has taught at Swarthmore College, Princeton University, and Ryder University, and has been a guest lecturer at the University of Puget Sound and Yale and Princeton Universities. Her scholarly work is widely published and cited in journals, collections of essays, reference books. She speaks at conferences and theaters across the country on professional women playwrights of the 18th century London, and she also loves to teach production dramaturgy, Shakespeare, restoration comedy, gender issues in theater, and staging the American experiences. And now, without further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce Melinda and turn it over to Melinda. Thank you. Good morning to those of you on the East Coast. Good afternoon, good evening for those of you farther away. Um, this is my talk on the theatrical Jane Austen. All of us here know that Jane Austen is one of literature's greatest treasures. Witty, brilliant, observant, earthy, just a little bit perverse. Last year, I understand this group, uh, their theme was the Austin, was Austen's Juvenilia. And I'd like to quote a few chapters of her greatly underestimated masterpiece, The Beautiful Cassandra. Chapter the second. When Cassandra had attained her 16th year, she was lovely and amiable 
and chancing to fall in love with an elegant bonnet her mother had just completed bespoke by the Countess of. She placed it on her gentle head and walked from her mother's shop to make her fortune. Chapter the third. The first person she met was the Viscount of a young man, no less celebrated for his accomplishments and virtues than for his elegance and beauty. She curtsied and walked on. Chapter the fourth. She then proceeded to a pastry cook's where she devoured six ices, refused to pay for them, knocked down the pastry cook and walked away. Cassandra's adventures continue in a similar fashion for the rest of the 12 chapters until she concludes, this is a day well spent. Jane Austen's no courtesy book heroine. Despite the heroine having Jane's sister's name, I've always thought the beautiful Cassandra tells us more about Jane Austen than any of her other works. Many readers have assumed that based on the private theatricals that were closed down on moral grounds in Mansfield Park, that like Fanny Price, Jane Austen was anti-theatrical. Considering the theme of this year's conference, I don't think I have to convince anyone that that is a fallacy. Jane Austen loved the theater. She loved reading plays, attending plays, and taking part in amateur theatricals. Although she never confused those performances with real hardened acting of professionals that she refers to in Mansfield Park. Her parents cultivated a love for theater in their children. Plays made up a large number of the books at the rectory. And one of the favorite day after dinner entertainments was reading plays out loud. When Jane's elder brothers, James and Henry went off to Oxford, they brought home an itch for acting on the holidays and their parents did nothing to discourage it. Between 1782 and 1790, the Austins staged a series of domestic productions. Their first productions took place in the house, but soon became too ambitious to be confined there. In 1784, they had moved to the barn with real painted flats. And we know about these because they were auctioned off when the Reverend George Austin retired and moved the family to Bath. Their very first production was Thomas Franklin's Matilda a historical and sensational drama that provided the undergraduates with great opportunity for dramatic ranting. It proved unintendedly comic. And thereafter, the troupe chose to perform intentional comedy. I love discovering that the plays produced at Steventon were a wide ranging represent representation of the contemporary canon that included some works by some of the most prominent women writers and popular playwrights of the day, Susanna Sontlever, who wrote in the early part of the 18th century, and Hannah Cooley and Elizabeth Inchbald, who were still writing during Austen's lifetime. Plays produced and considered included St. Lieber's The Wonder, A Woman Keeps a Secret, Isaac Bickerstaff's The Sultan, David Garrick's Ribald The Chances, Henry Fielding's farce, Tom Thumb, which parodies the excesses of Shakespearean, Shakespearean tragedy and includes a cast of giants and midgets, and dialogue that features conversations about gluttony, large breasts, and beds. Not much in the way of decorum or politeness there. Also Hannah Cooley's Which is the Man and Garrick's Bon Ton or High Life Above Stairs. Since the Steventon season was, was the Christmas holidays and culminated on Twelfth Night, it's not surprising that in 1789, one of the plays staged was James Townley's carnivalesque comedy, High Life Below Stairs in which the servants throw an extravagant party and masquerade as their noble masters while the master of the house is away. This topsy-turvy world is returned to its right order when the master returns, disguises himself to join the revelers and then reveals himself to pass punishment on the unruly servants. The Steventon theatricals took place during the time that Jane was writing her juvenilia. In those early works, it became clear that Jane preferred comedy. As she wrote in her, History of England from the reign of Henry IV to the death of Charles I by a partial and prejudiced and ignorant historian. One of Edward's mistresses was Jane Shore, who has had a play written about her, but it is a tragedy and therefore not worth reading. She was already knowledgeable enough about plays to parody them in a quite sophisticated style. Her minor works includes three miniature plays, all comedies, The Visit, a parody of society dramas in which everything that happens is absurd, but the characters exchange meaningless pleasantries while refusing to acknowledge that anything is amiss. The Mystery, a very short piece in which we neither learn what the mystery is nor how it resolves. 
and the first act of a comedy, which was a very light burletta, a musical. The playlets all include stage directions, such as instructions for character movements and asides. When Austin began to write Mansfield Park, she had a wellspring of experience to draw on about staging amateur theatricals. While the young people at Mansfield had ambitions to build their own theater space, they had to settle for converting a room in the manse for their purposes. On a, school, a smaller scale, the young people at Steventon began with the ambition of converting a room in the rectory into a temporary theater, but after two seasons, they were evicted to the barn. Another similarity between the Mansfield and Steventon theatricals were concerns about impropriety. One of the reasons Fanny Price so objects to the staging of Kotzebue's Lover's Vows is that the cast includes not just family, but also outsiders, the Crawfords and Mr. Yates. She's uncomfortable about the warm scenes of intimacy among the only lightly chaperoned young people. At Steventon too, the cast expanded beyond the immediate family to include cousins, local friends, and even some of Mr. Austin's pupils. We have no idea what Jane thought of this, Fanny cannot be considered a stand-in for her, but we do know that her brother Edward's family picked up the old tradition and held masquerades and private theatricals at the height of their annual Christmas celebrations. In 1806, he hosted a Twelfth Night Party featuring a masquerade that included adult cross-dressing, both men as women and women as men, as well as parts for all the children. The Steventon tradition was handed down to the next generation. Austin is reported to have loved acting, her niece Caroline recalls an occasion on which Jane picked up a volume of Evelina, which was a popular uh, a novel by Francis Burney, and read a few pages of Mr. Smith and the Branktons. And I thought it was like a play. She had a very good speaking voice. There is some speculative, and I emphasize the word speculative gossip about the mixed group, however. A friend of Jane's brother, Tom F a Fool, or Tom Fowl, I'm not sure quite how to pronounce that, took part in the Steventon theatricals. He spoke the epilogue to their original unintentionally comic production of Matilda, and later became en engaged to Jane's sister, Cassandra. And Austin biographer George Holbert Tucker speculates, again, that's the operative word here, that the pr private theatricals at Steventon provided plenty of material for Mansfield Park. St. Lever's The Wonder, like Lover's Vows, contains some warm parts regarding physical contact between a young man and the woman he loves. During the rehearsal for the production, the Austin's cousin, Eliza de Foyde, flirted with two of Jane brothers, Jane's brothers. Tucker even speculates that one of the reasons the theatricals ended in 1789 was because a family connection of the, of the Austins eloped with a woman he had met rehearsing a private theatrical and that Mr. and Mrs. Austin felt it might be injudicious to encourage further amateur theatricals. Penny Gay that the, said that, says that the erotic excitement finally had its results. Nine years later, in 1797, Henry Austin became Eliza's second hus husband. Very dangerous activity. Jane's appreciation was not limited to amateur performances. She attended professional performances whenever she could. As early as 1790, she was making references to star actors of the London stage. In Love and Friendship, she sums up what happens to two of her supporting characters by having the heroine inform her, dearest Marianne, that Philander and Gustavus, having raised their reputation by their performances in the theatrical line in Edinburgh, removed to Covent Garden, where they still exhibit under the assumed names of Lewis and Quick. Both William Thomas Lewis and John Quick were established leading actors at Covent Garden at the time Austin referred to them, and for many seasons thereafter. Quick was known especially for his comic roles. Around the time Austin was writing her Juvenilia, both actors created roles in one of Austin's favorite plays by one of her favorite playwrights. Lewis created the part of Doricourt, and John Quick created the role of Mr. Hardy in Hannah Cooley's The Bell's Stratagem. And this is a play I will be returning to later. Austin continued to refer to the professional theater in her novels. We have, a, her, our, we have our first definite record of her attending the theater in 1796. She attended Astley's Theater in Lambeth in the south of London. It was an, an unlicensed or illegitimate theater. London had only two royally patented theaters, 
Drury Lane, and Covent Garden, which were licensed to perform plays from fall to the spring. The Haymarket, also known as the Little Theater, was licensed to produce plays during the summer season. Any non-licensed theater could theoretically be shut down at any time. Astley's was a family-friendly, unpretentious theater offering a wide variety of entertainment, pantomimes, acrobatics, musicals, and even sword fighting. Austin uses it as the site of an outing by the John Knightley family and Emma. Harriet Smith accompanies them. It is the very kind of theater Robert Martin might attend on visiting London. And so it is that Harriet encounters him there and they rekindle their relationship. In Pride and Prejudice, when Lydia Bennett elopes with Wickham and is back in the protect protection of her uncle and aunt Gardner, she complains that she has not been allowed out at all, although London society is limited, is thin in the, excuse me, although London society is thin in the summer. The little theater in the Haymarket was open. More serious scenes take place in the theater's royal. In 1801, Reverend George Austin had retired with his wife and two daughters to Bath. Biographers say Jane was unhappy, but at least there she had more frequent access to good theater. The Theatre Royal in Orchard Street was licensed, the first theater licensed outside of London. Bath was considered the most elegant and judicious city in the kingdom. Its theater was the most important and successful playhouse outside of London. In Northanger Abbey, John Thorpe falsely tells General Tilney that Catherine is an heiress at the Theatre Royal in Orchard Street in Bath. It's also the site of Catherine and Henry Tilney's reconciliation after Thorpe has pre prevented Catherine from meeting Henry and his sister Eleanor, as she had promised. In Pride and Prejudice, Elizabeth and her Aunt Gardner have a serious conversation in a box of one of the patented theaters in London regarding Jane. And in Sense and Sensibility, Willoughby hears of Marianne's grave illness from Mr. Middleton in the lobby of Drury Lane. Each theater is appropriate to the season and the seriousness of the situation. Austin is able to talk about all these theaters in her novels because she attended and attended all of them and saw as many prominent actors and plays of, at her, the plays of her day as she could. Her brother Henry owned his, own, owned his own box at the Pantheon, another of London's unpatented theaters, which offered masquerades, musicals, and concerts. Whenever his sisters visited him, he arranged for tickets there and at various London theaters. Austin was a tough critic for actors. She greatly admired the work of Sarah Siddons, the renowned tragedian, and the rising star, rising star Edmund Keane. Of him, she wrote to Cassandra, we were quite satisfied with Keane. I cannot imagine better acting, but the part, Shylock in The Merchant of Venice, was too short. She wrote again to Cassandra, I shall like to see Keane again excessively and see him with you too. It appeared to me as if, as if there were no fault in him anywhere. Her disappointments were blunt. In a visit to London in 1811, Austin had been looking forward to seeing Sarah Siddons in Shakespeare's King John. At first it was announced that the performance Henry had scheduled for them to see, to see her was going to be replaced with another program. And so he gave up their seats. As it happened, the replacement was replaced with the original and Jane was quite upset. She wrote to Cassandra, I have no chance of seeing Mrs. Siddons. She did act on Monday, but as Henry was told by the box keeper that he did not think she would, the places and all thoughts of it were given up. I should particularly have liked seeing her in Constance and could swear at her with little effort for disappointing me. As Sarah Siddons was nearing retirement, Austin went to see the young actress advertised as being the next Siddons, Eliza O'Neill. After the performance, she wrote to Cassandra, I do not think she was equal to my expectation. I fancy I want something more than can be. Acting seldom satisfies me. I took two pocket handkerchiefs, but had very little occasion for either. In the same letter, in reference to the reputation O'Neill had as a hugging actress, she, Jane Arch, Archley acknowledged to Cassandra, she's an elegant creature and hugs Mr. Young delightfully. I'd like to give you an idea of what the night, a night in the theater in the late 18th and early 19th centuries was like for Austen and her contemporaries. A night at the theater at this period was very different from ours today. 
we go to see a show. The people of Austin's day went for an entire evening. It could last for five hours. There would be a five act main piece, either a comedy, a tragedy, or a musical. It might be broken up by intermezzi between the acts. Following the main piece, there would be a two or three act after piece, followed by a farce or adaptation of a Gothic novel. The secondary pieces did not need to have any connection to the main piece. They just needed to make people feel they had gotten their money's worth. Nor were you required to attend for the whole evening. People came and stayed for many reasons. Some came to see and be seen. Others had interests only in some of the entertainment. There is much conversation among audience members at their seats, in the boxes, or in the lobbies, as is evident in, in Austin's novels. Boxes were only held until the end of the, the first act of the main piece. After the third act, everyone was let in at half price. People of the lower classes would swarm in when the prices dropped. Some men of all classes felt free to assail the unattended women. And that was why women felt they needed to be accompanied by a man to the theater. Also, the very structure of the theater, bu theater building was in flux. During the turn of the 19th century, London's theaters were reaching the end of their evolution into the box theater we're so familiar with. For, for, from the Age Restoration through the 18th century, early London theater, uh, London theaters were like the ones like the ones in Bath were small and crowded, and they were more similar to our thrust stage than to a proscenium stage. It was what theater historian Allardyce Nicole refers to as a tripartite theater. There were three different spaces. And I'm gonna show you a, a picture and try to, try to share this with you. Let's hope this all works. There we go. Okay, so in a tripartite theater, you had the house. This is where the audience would sit. You had the scenic stage, which I'll talk about a little bit more in, in a moment. Um, it was, the actors did not perform in the scenic stage. It was just the place for scenes to take place. There was the, the back wall of the theater itself, behind which were the dressing rooms and various places for storing scenery. So this was the back wall. There were then rows of flats, essentially shutters, they called them, that could slide and open, slide to be opened or closed. This is, so to, the way it worked, I'm trying to use both my hands here, um, is that you had this piece of scenery back here. You could then have these various shutters come in and out. The way it worked was there were grooves on the floor of the stage. And each set of grooves had two flats that were possible to move in and move out. So between the, the three times two, which is six, plus the backdrop, there were seven possible back, backdrop rounds that you could have on any given night. And they, they would move in and move out very quickly. They also had wings attached to them, which you could turn and create a solid, uh, a solid scene, which you wouldn't see the breaks. But uh, these would, you could also, these could close, be closed, and then, whoops, sorry, oh no. Um, just a second, let me see if I can get, hold on, oh no, we just, I'm gonna stop the share and go back to the beginning, just a second, here we go. Okay, oops. Let me see if I can get through to this. All right, I wanna go back to, I think I'm gonna to have to scroll through this entire thing. I'm screen, I'm, I don't wanna be sharing right now. Just a second. I want to go here. I want to go here and I wanna move back and it won't let me. Okay, I'm going to, have to move, I'm gonna to have to just go very quickly through. I'll come back to these pictures later.
There we go. And now we'll do the slideshow. Sorry about that. I'm Okay, here we go again. So these, uh, as I was saying, these flats could slide in and out. What you could also do with them is if you could have, if you wanted to use the front scene, for example, um, you could have behind it another scene being set up so that you could just open and discover a scene. They would call those discovery scenes. And that could be like another room in a house. It could be a cavern or some other hidden space that would just be revealed by pulling the, the, the shutters open. You could also, if you wanted to create something more spectacular, you could have on the back, uh, the, in, on the backdrop, you could have uh, a particular scene like a cavern or something of that type. And then you could create a false perspective. You would have the, the first um, shutter almost closed, but revealing the back of that cavern. The next one would be a little bit more open, a little bit more open, a little bit more open, forming a V shape and that would then um, give you the false sense of perspective that it look, would look like it was much farther away. Um, so at any rate, these scenes changes could be very quick. And you can see also that here is the house back here, but you may notice there are different play stages in it. Um, here is the pit where the young bucks like John Thorpe um, and critics would, would hang out and they would be talking over the actors and shouting lines just like John Thorpe does. You had the upper gallery, which is where the very rowdy lower classes would sit. You would have the second gallery, which is where the middle class people would sit, citizens and their wives. And then you would have the amphitheater or the front boxes and the boxes that were on the sides. And that was where more wealthy people would sit. And it's where most of Jane Austen's characters sit. Now, these would be lining the stage so that the way the actors, the actors would be surrounded on three sides. And this was called the apron or the platform. And that's where the actors would act, not back in the scenic stage. They'd be very close to the audience. Um, as a matter of fact, so close that during the restoration, sometimes really wealthy men would bribe their way to get seats on the stage so that they could try to converse with the actresses during the play and they were shopping for a new mistress. So uh, it could get pretty rowdy and it was a very, very diverse audience. Um, now, what happened here is that during the, as the, as the century went on, um, there was more, a more of a desire to sell more seats. And the, the, there was very little way to do that because if you take a look at how this theater fills this building, there's very little extra room. And London and Bath for that matter were very densely populated cities. And there weren't places that you could just expand easily, uh, expand a building easily. So generally you needed to wait for a building to burn down or a conveniently located building to do the same. And then you could expand the theater, but that didn't happen very often. So the only other thing that you could do was chop away at this apron. And that would drive the audiences back, uh, the, uh, drive the actors back towards the center stage and move, create additional seats in here. Now that doesn't seem so bad because you still have audience very close to where the actors are, but the actors are getting very much farther away from the audiences in the boxes or in the galleries. And the result of that was that it made this, this set, these plays much less intimate. With the large platform, when there were sides, the actors could just turn to the audience as if making a private joke to a friend. But as they're moving back further, they're being driven back towards the proscenium arch, that becomes not possible. And sometimes these boxes above the theater disappear because you're driving the, the, the stage back further than the boxes. So you can't address the people in the boxes at all. So not only did this change the audience's relationship, it changed how playwrights had to write their plays. Because remember, there were no sound, there were no sound effects, um, there were sound effects, but there was no sound system for projection. So the farther the actors got away from the, uh, their audiences, 
the less they could communicate verbally. So for example, they, they changed the way dramatists worked, uh, wrote their plays. They had to accommodate more physical comedy into their plays or more outlandish types of tragedy, which would make use of special effects back in the, in the scenic area. Lots of temples and lots of caves and lots of places where disasters could happen. Um, so in 1801, a lot of this, this change had already occurred, but even so, the Orchard Street Theater in Bath could hold only 900 to 1,000 people in it, the, the pit the boxes, the first gallery and the upper gallery. Um, and the size of these theaters was small. In that space where you were holding 900 to 1,000 people, the dimensions were about 40 feet wide by 45 feet deep. So if you can imagine cramming that many people into that space, you can understand how extremely crowded this was. So in 17, uh, 80, wait, I'm sorry, the date here was in 1805, the Theater Royal in Bath built an entirely new theater in a more central location and it doubled the size of the audience. In the later part of the 18th century, theatrical tastes and the desire to maximize the number of seats had made increasing the size a priority for the theaters, and increasing this, the, the amount of seats that they had. Um, let me just see. So as I said, intimacy was lost. Spectacle became, spectacle and histrionics were required to communicate with the audience. And there was, as I said, there was no sound system. So playwrights and audience goers, uh, theater goers alike mourned this change in the stage and the, the kinds of play, they, the fact that they didn't have that intimate relationship. Um, Hannah Cooley retired from the theater because she found that she, that her, the theater of wit that she produced, that she wrote, was not appreciated enough. That she would find that actors, because the audience couldn't hear the witty comments very clearly, uh, actors would, would substitute pratfalls and knocking people off of chairs and things instead of the language. Playwright Elizabeth Inchbold also agreed with Cooley and Jane Austen wrote in a letter in 1813 that she thought the theater was at a low ebb at present. Let's stop this share for a minute. Okay. I had the good fortune to dramaturg a production of the Bell Stratagem, Cooley's Bell Stratagem, uh, at the Oregon Shakespeare Festival in 200, 2005. As, as, um, as, as, yeah, uh, as Susie and um, Janet were mentioning. It contains one of the two favorite lines by Cooley that Austin used to quote. The first was from Cooley's Which is the Man? And it is the heroine, Lady Bell's, witty heroine, Lady Bell's retort, tell him what you will. And the second was from the Bell Stratagem. And it has Flutter the Flop, of uh, Flutter the, tongue twister, Flutter the Fop uh, saying, Mr. Court has, Mr. Doracourt has traveled. He knows best. This second quote sounds rather innocuous until you know the context. And this will also give a brief summary of the play so I don't have to explain that any further when I show you pictures for, of the costumes. Doricourt is a young man of the town. He's just returned from the continent. He's handsome, he's the height of fashion and he's witty and he's very full of himself. He's been betrothed to Letitia Hardy since childhood but hasn't seen her since. He's ready to sign and seal the bargain but he isn't head over heels for her. She, on the other hand, falls for him when they meet and is struck into silence by her overwhelming passion for him. She concocts a stratagem on the theory that it's easier to convert hate into love than to convert indifference into a passion. So to make him hate her and then win him in disguise at a masquerade. She succeeds, but since all of their mutual friends are in on the plot, they're all ready to take Doricourt down a few pegs. They arrange to pressure him into marrying the girl he now hates before she reveals herself as the mystery woman from the masquerade. At the point where the marriage has been performed, but Doricourt is in despair, his friends mock wonder why he has married a woman for whom he had such antipathy. Flutter remarks, Mr. Doricourt has traveled. He knows best. 
holding Dora Court's supposed sophistication up to ridicule. ridicule. It's a line worthy of Austin. So I want to show you some pictures, a bunch of pictures from the Bell Stratagem, mostly to show you the, the costumes of the time. The, these costumes are true to the 1780s, with the exception of Doricourt, who was on the cutting edge of fashion, fashion forward. And so our wonderful costume designer, Deborah Dryden, decided to put him in Regency costume, moving him 10 years ahead. A Little bit much, but it got the point across. Um, so this isn't set on a classic 18th century theater, but aspects of it were borrowed and adapted. And I wanna point those out to you as well. So right now I'm going to oops, share once again and show you pictures from the Bell Stratagem. As this, these, these, the colors are not necessarily true to the time. They're a little bit confectionary, but the styles are absolutely true. Where is my share screen? Here. Okay, now. Here. Where'd the pictures go? Ah, there we go. This is the this is the villain of the piece whose name is Courthall. And you can see the beautiful and elaborate decoration on his costume here. This is Mr. Savile in the background. He is one of the good guys in the play, and he's just come in for the country. So you can see he's in much more simple clothes, but they're still cut in the appropriate way. This is Dora Court here and he's in his dressing gown. Um, he will see him in just a minute in his Regency costume. But I also want to point out, pay attention to the background of the piece. This is the back wall of, this, of the set. Okay, so here you can see in the set, you can see ooh, there's Dora Court in his Regency jacket and outfit compared to the people who are dressed 1780 style. And this is his French servant here. But you can see here that, that, that two, essentially shutters have been brought together to give the backdrop. The backdrop here is um, imaginary. It is, it, they took the set designer, Bill Bloodgood, took a painting by Canaletto, a very famous painter of the, of the period, who did riverscapes of buildings in Venice and in London and in other cities in, in Italy. And he would have a river scene with all the buildings. So here, the scenes, the buildings were replaced with buildings by the architect, uh, Sir John Soames, who was very popular at the time. These buildings here and here, and it doesn't look like it, but over here, um, are models of Sir John Soames' buildings that he designed. They turn around to become elements in the set and they slide to create different environments that indicate different rooms and different places within the, within the play. So they are replacing the shutters that come in and out. In a little short time, you'll see what happens when these back shutters open up. But this is Dora Card again, Savile, the French servant. Now we get into um, Letitia Hardy's household. Now that tall building you saw before turns around and becomes the bookcase that indicates that we're in the Hardy household. Um, these, this, these characters, you can see again, beautiful brocade jacket, beautiful brocade on her dress, probably not, the time wouldn't be, have been so pastel, but otherwise true to form. And this is Flutter Arfop, who says the famous line, who is in this magnificent costume and you can't quite see it here, but his wig is, has a slight pink tint to it. And now we finally meet our heroine, Letitia, and she's disappointed with Dora Court's reaction to her, and she's receiving um, very, uh, very serious advice from Mrs. Rackett. And Mrs. Rackett happens to be a widow. Now, normally, and there's comments made about it that she should be dressed in much more somber colors, but she instead she's dressing like a fine lady. So um, Mrs. Mrs. Rackett is a lady about town. She is very social, she's very witty, she's the life of the party. So this is Hannah Cooley breaking down some stereotypes about how women should behave. Here is Letitia getting her brilliant idea about what she's going to do to win over Doricourt. And that is her father in the background. There'll be, I think, better pictures of him later. 
And here again is Dora Court. You can see now this, this short building here actually was, was his dressing table. It closes up and turns around and becomes this building here. And the sofa just being in this location indicates that we're at, at the, um, the Touchwoods household. That's the secondary plot. And here is Miss Ogle, a friend of Mrs. Rackett. And they're all at the they come to the Touchwood houses too because Sir George Touchwood has very old fashioned notions about how women should behave and he's keeping his wife virtually imprisoned and they come to free her. And there she is making fun of Sir George. And this is his wife, Lady Frances in the background. And you can see that she's wearing a costume that's even, even the fabric is more typical of the time. It says it's a sprigged muslin, just like Catherine buys when she's in Bath. And you can see more of the set and the pieces there. Here is Letitia enacting her, her stratagem. She's appearing like a country bumpkin. Um, and shocking Dora Court, who can't believe that this is the woman he's going to have to marry. And again, you can see the, the there's the, the dressing table building and there is the, um, the tall building that becomes the bookcase. This is the masquerade scene. Um, and you can see here what's happened is the two flats have opened, revealing this discovery space, which goes back to the back wall with the, the, the chandeliers hanging. Um, and everybody here is in very jewel-like colors, partly indicating the deep night that they're in. Now, here are, this is Flutter in his devil's costume with real cloven feet. Um, and Mrs. Racket in her Bird of Paradise costume. Now, some people might say, oh, well, that's just not period appropriate. But masquerades were very daring events where, people, women especially, could come in very daring outfits because nobody knew who they were. There was, in the earlier part of the 18th century, there was one society woman who under a mask came in such transparent clothes that she was effectively nude. Um, so this isn't too far off the mark. Oops, oh dear, okay. And here is Letitia entering the masquerade. Uh, I'm gonna have to move you guys where I see you guys down. Okay, um, so you can see she, everyone else is in these, these deep jewel colors. And you can see here the mirror in the back, uh, that there's a mirror in the background making this space look even larger and reflecting all the light and Patricia's gown. It's, it is ice blue covered with crystals. So she sparkles when she comes in. And here she is charming Dora Court in disguise. There is a subplot going on with, um, with the villain, Mr. Cordall, who has decided that he wants, that because he knows that Saville was once in love with Lady Frances, he wants to try to seduce her. And this is this very typical theme in 18th century novels uh, that at a masquerade, someone would, would disguise themselves as a woman's brother or husband or fiance and whisk her away to her destruction at a masquerade. So Sa this is Saville over here who's dressed up as a magician and Lady Frances who's dressed up as a nun uh, and he's come to warn her that the man who has just said in, in his costume, who was who disguised like her husband in her husband, the same costume that her husband is wearing, that he wants to take her home. He wants to warn her about that and guide her to her, her real husband. Um, and he has to reveal who he is in order to convince her. Um, and let me just, and here everyone goes to Cordall's house to see what has happened. You know, he claims he's got this society woman in his bedroom and uh, they are, they're coming to see her, but what he really has is a, 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 prostit a prostitute or courtesan disguised as Lady Frances in Lady Frances's costume and they're going to make fun of him. And you can see here with the, there, there's a lot of cross-dressing. Here's this man dressed up as a woman. Um, there were women dressed up in, as men also at the masquerade. And here they are, and you can see another one of the flats. This was from the stage curtain, which I didn't have a chance to show you, um, which was picture, pic 18th century pictures from magazines and newspapers of the time. But you can get a better sense of that back panel where you have the false sense of, of uh, perspective on the river scene. And here is Kitty Willis, the prostitute or, or courtesan, really having fun 
poking fun at, uh, uh, at Cordall. And here you can see more pictures from that, that uh, the curtain that, are, that is opened. Doricourt decides the only way to, he's now in love with this mystery woman, the only way to get out of his marriage to Letitia is to pretend to be mad. So he concocts this scheme with Saville, who when, when Flutter comes to call, um, Doricourt pretends to be mad for him. And then, then they send Flutter out to spread the news by telling him, no one knows, don't tell anybody. And now they're sure that everyone will hear this. Then Doricourt goes to the Hardys, to put to um, uh, to stage his mad act, but everybody now is already knows what he's going to do, and they all are mocking him and making fun of him. Doricourt then is forced by them to honor his duty to Mr. Hardy and marry his daughter because they're saying that Hardy is is dying and won't last long, and that is that he in, in honor's name he must marry her. When he comes out, having married her indeed back in, in the back, the off stage, they then tease him about uh, or mock him, but how could you marry someone who you hated so much when you're in love with someone else? And he says, but you all pressured me to do that. And Flutter says, well, I thought Mr. Doricourt has traveled. He knows best. So he's, throw, he's holding uh, Doricourt's supposed sophistication against him and ever and using this line to mock him. And that's really a line in Austin's own style. So after the, after the marriage, the mystery woman shows up and she reveals herself and everyone lives happily ever after. And that is really what I wanted to show you. I wanted to talk to you about Austin's involvement in the theater and what the theater was like in her day. So now I'd be happy to answer any questions anyone has. We have a few already. And if anybody else has a question, please enter it in the chat box or um, feel free also to raise your hand. Um, one of the first questions was who licensed the theaters and how exactly did that work? The, the theaters were licensed by the king or queen, depending on who was on the throne at the time. And uh, there was a lord, uh, the, who, uh, the, the last one who held this post was Lord Larpent, who would read all the plays and say whether or not they were okay or they had to be censored and not produced at the royal theaters. Uh, and that is why the Huntington has all of these manuscripts because Lord Larpent being the last person to hold the, the job of essentially the, cent the licensor of the plays, um, his, his collection, which was the collection of all the plays from the 18th century went on the market. And Henry Huntington had sent agents to Europe to pick up anything interesting and they picked up the whole Larpent collection, which is why it's such a wonderful research library for someone like me. That's incredible. <laughs> um, Someone asked if with the performances so long, like five hours in the theater tonight, what were the restroom facilities like? Uh, there really weren't any. I suppose people would go outside. Um, if women could afford it. They had maids who, <laughs> who would, I guess, provide chamber pots. I'm not really sure. Um, no, I don't know. I think you had to learn in such a society, you would need to learn to hold it or not drink a lot before you went. For the men, it was less an issue. Yes. <laughs> Janet, you have more to contribute on this? Yeah, I did a, a presentation some time ago on bathrooms <laughs> in Jane Austen's time. And the theaters had pit privies down in the basement, which unfortunately only got cleaned maybe once a year. So you had to be pretty desperate to use one. And I understand that was one of the reasons that they didn't have a lot of theater in the summer is that it, there was so much smell coming up from the basement into the theater that people didn't want to go. And I imagine the women were less likely to use it, especially the women from the boxes. Exactly. And especially in the 18th century, when they had these wide pannier skirts, they had trouble getting through the narrow doorways and even using the pit privies. Yes, especially without damaging the dresses, I would imagine. Absolutely. Um, another person asked about the lighting by candles and what kind of fire hazard that was. 
you know, a lot of theaters did burn. Um, yes, and that was partly why. Um, they, the, there would be, um, the light, there would be lights, there would be candle lights, footlights at the base of the stage. There, they did have mechanisms, I think, with using reflectors and candles along the sides uh, or oil lamps. But again, it was very dangerous. It was, it was quite dangerous. Um, but they, they were able to do a lot of spectacular effects, but lighting was always a difficult issue. You had a chandeliers as well. So primitive lighting as far as what we were concerned, but they could do shipwrecks and all kinds of scenery like that. Interesting. How, how many theaters were there in Austin's day? I know there were, you said there were two that were licensed, but how many unlicensed um, do you know? Uh, I don't know the number of them, but there were quite a few. A lot of them would, would open for short times and then be closed down. Um, some of them managed by doing what uh, the Pantheon did is they wouldn't show actual plays. They would have musical entertainments and you could get away with that for a while. And you would have those plays out in the you know, out in the provinces as well. But yeah, there were only two licensed theaters during this period, two licensed theaters in London and the one in Bath in England. The other place would have been uh, in Dublin, the Smock, uh, Smock Street Theater, but that was in Ireland. Yeah. Um, another question is about how Jane Austen placed her characters, uh, her theater going characters where they could only see each other um, and then nod an acknowledgement. And the question is, while you were in a box in the theater, could you um, speak with people in a neighboring box? That's a good question. I don't think you, I, I mean, I think there were, you were separated by people in, uh, from in, people in different boxes, but you could nod and wave to people across in the boxes across from you. Um, but I don't think you could, I don't think you could talk to people in the neighboring box unless you exited the box towards the back. And there, you know, there would be a passageway back there. But um, I think you would be less likely to see the people. Um, I suppose you could crane your head around, but that would be awkward. Okay. Uh, another person asked about women playwrights and did they write more or equal roles for women and men? Where Shakespeare, the comment was that, you know, Shakespeare tended to write a little bit more frequently from male characters. So well, of course, women Shakespeare playwrights balance, yeah. Well, Shakespeare of course didn't have actresses. Um, but yes, one of the nice things, the fun things about Santlever and Cooley and Inchbald is they wrote not only more female characters, but more independent and uh, sprightly and witty characters, more like Rosalind than, um, than some of the shy retiring characters that you even see in, in Lover's Vows or plays of that nature. Uh, sentimental comedy was coming into being at the time, and these those women were not nearly as active and independent as the women and the, as the women in the women playwrights plays. Another question was whether you have any speculation of what play Catherine would have seen in Bath. I don't. They don't make any. They don't have any description of it. It could have been, it, it could have been anything because they were doing plays. They were doing Shakespeare. They were doing plays from the Restoration. They were doing plays from the early 18th century. It'd be really hard to speculate on what particular play she was seeing, since I don't really know what year she was supposed to be there. Can I can I ask you as a follow up? Uh, did they was Henry V one of the plays that would have been in circulation in Bath at that time? Do you happen to know? I don't happen to know, but I don't see why it wouldn't have been. I mean, the, the actors, unlike today's actors who perform an A play at a time and need to know that play and their lines very well, for an 18th century actor, you had to have a repertory of like 30 or more plays in your head and be told the morning of the play, this is what you're gonna be doing tonight and be able to just go and do it. So if it was in their repertory at all, it's possible that they, were doing, that they could have done it a night that one of the characters was there. The, the reason I mention it is because there's a romantic scene at the end of the play involving Henry and Catherine. So yes. it would be it would oh. be the kind of thing Jane Austen would be thinking about at that moment, right? So. Uh, it's very, it's possible. It's possible, although Henry and Catherine are names she uses an awful lot, but I, it's certainly possible. 
She knew her Shakespeare well. Mm -hmm. I preferred the comedies. <laughs> uh, another person asked, you mentioned that the audience talking out loud and yelling it. Uh, do, uh, can you talk a little bit more about that? How that was really common that people would shout over the actors. Yeah. The people in the, in the pit would heckle. And there was a lot of conversation going on. If you think about her plays, people are talking in the boxes all the time. There are also scenes where, for example, where um, Willoughby hears about Marianne, it's in the lobby of the, of the so it's possible. People didn't come and just stay there and sit for the whole period of time. I think I skipped uh, in, I was talking without looking at my particular, my script, um, but people would come for various reasons. Some people would just come to see and be seen. And other people would come because they wanted to see a particular piece, the maybe the main piece, maybe the after, one of the after pieces, but they would come for that. Um, in between with the parts that they weren't as interested in, they could go and talk in the lobby or talk in their box and make disturb other people. But it was, it was a very diverse audience and the people in the upper gallery would also be very loud. Um, so it was not like today where we could assume that the audience will be quiet in watching the play. It was a much more, for lack of a better word, circusy type of atmosphere. I mean, there were people who seriously went to see the plays. And I imagine you were better off in the box seats because you were more protected from the people around you um, if you really wanted to watch. But it, it was a free for all in the upper gallery and down in the pit. Can you talk a little bit more about the transition and time from like when Anna Cooley decided to stop writing because of the, the witty um, kind of style wasn't as popular anymore? Well, she, she, wrote, she wrote in her last play, The Town Before Us, that she, was, that she was retiring, that she had watched the rehearsals for this play and saw that, in or, that rather than her words, people were pulling chairs out from under e each other and doing pratfalls um, to keep the audience's attention. And she thought, this is not what I got in this business for. And her, she was known for her theater of wit, that her plays, her dialogue was sharp and scintillating and funny. And here, nobody really, the audience was so far away from the actors that they couldn't really hear what she had to say. And she longed for the days of, um, she talks about playwrights from the early part of the 18th century, or even from Garrick's time when words were really important. Um, and she said, from this, from this kind of theater, it's time to take my leave. And that was in 1794. And it was actually quite a daring play as well. So it wasn't a matter that she was writing conservative plays. It was quite daring, but people weren't interested in, pay, uh, in for understandable reasons. They couldn't hear the language. So that's why. And Elizabeth Inchbald had the same feelings about it. I don't, she didn't retire at the time, but she did do more work with editing and creating collections of plays of the period. So a lot of plays that we have are because Elizabeth Inchbald preserved them. Um, another person asking, this is back kind of to the heckling, did the audience critique the plays while they watched? Of course. Of course they did. <laughs> Especially, I mean, everyone, of course, always has their private opinions, but the people in the pit would tell their opinions, you know, speak their opinions very loudly. They didn't write, uh, you know, um, they didn't write essays in the newspapers, but that was left to the critics themselves. But sometimes they thought they knew better than the critics and they would have no hesitation in saying so. Um, the question about um, Bridgerton, have you seen that the acting scenes there um, of the stage? From, you, well, I've seen from Richardson's uh, Charles, Charles Grandison. Bridgerton. The, oh, Bridgerton. No, sorry. <laughs> Bridgerton with the restoration, with the, with the Regency costumes. Yeah. Did you see, have you seen that? And did you see that like the acting scene, there's an actress who's one of the characters. And, I didn't see that uh, scene. I didn't, I'm sorry. No, just, if you can tell me about it, it would be interesting. Uh, they show some of the, the raucous, uh, some of the raucousness of the theaters and then the searching for a mit mistress. Uh, when you were talking about that, that kind of came to mind a little bit though. That um, mostly happened earlier in the century. Uh, men were not allowed on the stage later on, but during the restoration, that happened quite a bit, especially noblemen, particularly. Okay. Um, 
the Folger Shakespeare, this is another question. Folger Shakespeare Theater in DC has a very intimate theater. Um, you feel as if the actors were speaking directly to you. That's just a comment. Um, mm -hmm. Were the theaters in London considered superior to Bath? Um, I don't, I think Bath was considered on par with the theaters in London. And the reason partly for that was Bath was considered the most sophisticated city in England. Um, so they had good people, actors from London would go to Bath and perform there. So you could see Sarah Siddons perform in Bath, for example. So you, the theater there was, was excellent. Wonderful. Um, another question just came in. When did women on stage become acceptable? Restoration. In the, in the restoration. That was, it was a big deal because when um, Charles II came back from the continent, he was used to seeing women on stage in France and around the continent. They had, they had, they had been there for a long time. And so he immediately said why you, uh, women should play women on stage. Um, does anybody else have a question? Did I miss anybody with a hand up or a question? Looks like Linda Dittmore does. Let's see. Sorry, it's starting to type when you ask that. Um, is who's working on these plays today in the states? I'm in uh, Southern California, but let's see. Uh, it, who's working on them? Um, the people I know are um, Misty Misty Anderson, at the University of Tennessee Knoxville. Uh, who else is working on them? Tanya Caldwell, but I'm not, I don't, she's not, I don't think she's based in. I, I'm sorry, I didn't meet in academia. I met in the theaters. Oh, you not some of the works that might be in process. Well, I would keep my, I, I don't know where you're located. Southern California. Okay, I would keep my eye out for USC. We're likely, to, we did a Susanna Santlieber play about two years ago, and we're likely to do another one soon. Um, right now in this climate, um, with the theaters being closed, it's not likely that the first things that they're going to be doing will be the 18th century women. So, and it, it is places that, like the Oregon Shakespeare Festival that would be likely to have them or other types of repertory theaters where they wouldn't be completely dependent on, on how well they drew the audience for that particular one play. But uh, I don't know anyone right now considering it, but the pandemic has changed so much. Um, another question just came in. When did audience start to like be quiet uh, where you could count on them to be silent during the production? <laughs> That's a good question. That's a really good question. Um, I'm not sure. Uh, I don't know, for example, how they were when Lincoln was in the theater. Uh, I don't know at which point, what point the audiences were more tamed and became, I, I would expect in the later part of the 19th century, but that's a guess. That's, as I said before, that's speculation. I don't know as much about that period of time. Who are your other favorite 18th century um, women playwrights? Oh, Susanna Santlieber, definitely. Um, I like Elizabeth Griffith with some of her plays. Um, she can be fun because Although some people consider she had a real hard time establishing herself because she was known for these very moralizing letters she and her husband wrote back and forth to each other. She was a celebrity for that. So people had a hard time taking her seriously as a comic writer, but she brought some Commedia dell'arte um, models into some of her plays. So she's a lot of fun. Um, and who else do I, do I, who do I really love? Saint Lever, Cooley, Griffiths, oh, well, actually, I guess technically she is 18th century. Mary Picks. Mary Picks writes outstandingly funny plays, but, and I would love, love, love to do a production of her, The Innocent Mistress. Problem is, has a huge cast, which five interlocking uh, plots. A director would need to be very ambitious and daring to try to attempt it, but it's, hysterical. My students start out being just blown over by how many characters and how many scenes there are. But once we've gone through the play and they start getting it, they love it and they want to do it. So I hope someday to see that done. 
The play we did at USC two years ago was Sant Lever's The Busybody, which was one of the most popular plays of the entire century. Actually, that's why I should say that some of these women's plays were among the most popular of the century. So that it's not, I, I, was, I was so happy to see that Austin was a fan because these, these women's plays were being done all the time. The Bell Stratagem was, I think, if it wasn't the, it was certainly one of the top, the most produced plays of the late 18th century. It opened in 1780. And I don't know if people are familiar with the way plays ran at that time, but her play was, that play was produced over 200 times between 1780 and 1800. Um, so that was, a, that was huge. If a play ran for three nights, then the author got paid. And that was a big deal. Most plays didn't make it that far. After that, the, the author got paid every third night. If you made it to a sixth night, it was a blockbuster. If you made it to a ninth night, that was almost unheard of. And Hannah Cooley's plays went, you know, blockbuster status plus. Um, we had someone made a make a comment about when the audience became quiet. And um, he says it was gradually over the course of the 19th century. That's what I would have expected. And then we have, so, oh, really? go ahead. No, I was just gonna say, I figured by the late part of the century, it had become pretty quiet, but I don't have any idea of the dates, but so I thank you, appreciate that knowledge. Well, we have a really interesting question that just came in. I'm a stand-up and actress memorized 30 plays. How quickly were they expected to learn new ones? And are, contem are there contemporary accounts of actors getting lost and drying up or coming out with lines from the wrong play? <laughs> They were given a very short time to learn plays. It, you, it, you it would, um, you have to realize they had to do a lot more memorizing than we do because you couldn't just make copies of something. So they had to learn in just a few days to learn a new role, and then they needed to keep it. I am, I don't. There are records of people going down on lines and not remembering. I don't hear. I don't recall reading anything about somebody coming out with lines from a different play. But yeah, there are. I can't name who, but there are mentions of in gossip columns that somebody went down on the line and you said something nonsensical or something like that until they got back on track. Did they have prompters back in, the, in that time? Yes, like they did. Yes, they did, they did have prompters so that that wouldn't go on too long. Okay. Great. Um, anybody else have questions? I don't think we have any more that I've missed, but please let me know if we have. Um, I don't see any hands up. I see the question that um, that they memorized 30 plays. Their memories were much better than ours. We don't, we don't exercise our memories the same way. Do you know, I mean, was there a, a re I mean, you said that, you know, they, they didn't have as many copies, so they had to do that, but was there some other reason, like the way that they were, they were learning that's different than Actress well, yes, they, they were learning to recite in their in schools that they would learn to memorize and recite long passages. And we've gotten away from that pedagogical technique. Uh, but that goes like all the way back to Rome and Greece that you would learn to recite whole speeches and you would keep them in memory and pe people could quote vast sections of Shakespeare or what I mean, well, not that wasn't in Rome, but they could they could just recite speeches, if you think about in Hamlet, they, uh, Hamlet asks the player king, can you give us this scene from this play? And the player king just does immediately. And that is, that's not artistic license. That is the way an act actors had to be. So you would learn these, I don't know what mnemonics you would use, but clearly you did. Oh, the, yes, I, I saw that. The Bell Strategy, I saw that production. Yes. And yeah. the Red Bull Theater did a production online uh, on Zoom of the Bell Strategy. I made a comment earlier that someone actually saw the production that you um, worked on in, at the Oregon Shakespeare um, Festival and thought it was just absolutely wonderful. So um, I was sure that. Thank you. I was thrilled with that production. It really uh, a highlight for me. I see someone, ra William, raising his hand. You're muted, muted, still muted, William. You this, this is a little outside the box, and I'm sure you know this place, but I've had the privilege of two or three times going to the opera at the Drottning Home Court Theater outside Stockholm. And if you want, if anybody's interested in seeing 
opera staged exactly as it was during Jane Austen's time, it's a splendid place to go. Um, oh, that's uh, wonderful. Yeah, I, I saw the, the, the uh, you know, some Mozart and, and, and of course, one of the reasons things would be so loud is, is that the lights in the house were kept on during the whole show to say to be safer they had sconces on the, this little theater in the in the royal palace at Drottningholm in Sweden um, there are sconces on the walls with candles in them burning the whole time and so the place is lit up and people are that kind of encourages people not to be quiet but to talk to each other that's true that's very very true but anyway, I imagine the boxes had sconces if you if you haven't ever been to Drottningholm Court Theater, I I suggest you you make a trip because it's an amazing place, still kept in its exact. It, the, the 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 operas that are performed there are completely uh, contemporary with Jane Austen's lifetime. Oh, that's wonderful! And and the productions are all done. Well, you know the scenery comes in from the side, just like you were showing us in the in the in in the the beginning places. And my one question about that is. Where did people enter the stage, the, the acting space from? There were doors in front of the shutters. Uh -huh. before, and they would enter through those doors. There, was, there used to be two, there originally were two sets of doors. And as the apron moved back, it, be, it became just one. And when the apron moved back further, then they, had, they came in from the wings or the back or doors in the back. And thank you very much, by the way. You're welcome. See, I have been to the Drotting Home Theater. I haven't seen a production there, but it is a spectacular place to visit. They have tours all day, every day. Oh, um, I, multiple I, languages. It's really incredible. I hope I get the chance to be there. Yeah, and you can take a little uh, a little boat from um, downtown Stockholm to yes. the, the palace. It's really the, great. The, the, the Ingmar Bergman film of Magic Flute is set largely in that. That's oh. the theater that those things are done in. In Bergman's magic. Uh -huh, in Bergman. Oh, that's oh, that's interesting. I have to notice that next time I watch it. Oh, we have another question. Did Austin attend opera? Yes. Uh, I don't have I don't have any records of it, but she, but she attended all kinds of performances at these various theaters. So she did, doesn't write about the opera, but I'm sure she she must have seen it. In the letters she mentions. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, I was gonna. I was gonna mention that that she. I think it's 1813. She went to. It was actually at Covent Garden. She. I don't know if she ever went to Italian opera. That was very elite entertainment. But she went to. I think it was Covent Garden, and she saw Thomas Arne's Artaxerxes, which was an English opera. Yeah. And mm. then there was a farce and a and a comedy afterwards. So just as you were mentioning, it's the long endless performance of of. Uh, evening at the theater, but and, she, and it was the uh, debut season of a singer named Catherine Stevens, uh, mm. soprano. And and there's a comment where Austin says basically, eh, she wasn't that good. Uh, so she, you know, it's very typical. And she says it in a much more witty Austin-like way, but that's basically her, what, her dry wit. That's exactly. Uh, Jan had a question: Did people bring food and drink to the theater? Uh, you know, I'm sure in the upper, in the upper, I'm sure in the, in the pit and in the upper gallery, they did. I don't, I don't recall any mention of that in the boxes. I don't recall any mention anywhere of, in fiction or any, or in any of Jane Austen's novels that anyone talked about food in the boxes. I don't believe so. I think that probably would have considered, be con been considered a classe. But again, I, somebody could correct me on that. And you also mentioned that people, you know, avoided drinking. Uh, women did anyway, so they didn't have to use the facilities that didn't exist, or <laughs> and, and smelling everything up. Okay. Um, what else? Anybody else have a question? I think we. This has been a really fascinating conversation, uh, presentation. I think um, it's been really delightful, and we're so grateful. Lots of great comments in the um, chat. Um, we really enjoyed having everybody here. Thank you all for coming. Any parting words, Melinda, or anybody else? No, I just wanted to say thank you so much. I hope it gave you some insight into the, what Austin's theatrical life was like, um, both as a participant and as an observer. Um, I just, I love the parts where she saved her serious conversations, uh, real serious ones for the patent theaters and 
lighter conversation or minor, more minor characters for, <laughs> for the illegitimate theaters. But thank you. Thank you so much. It's nice to have a chance to talk about this. I don't get a chance to do that often. And hopefully soon we can all go to the theater again. <laughs> it's looking wonderful. Yes. Yes. You can all unmute yourselves if you want to give a little round of applause. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for coming. And Thanks, Melinda. You're welcome. And if uh, we're doing any of these, uh, any of these 18th century plays at USC, I'll let you know, Susie and Janet. Okay. And we'll let all of you know. So thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thanks very thank much. You, Susie. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everybody, for coming. Hi, everyone.